They're not, some people talk about them as if they're negative assets, they're not. <coughs> so they're impacting negatively on the assets, and so you need to write down the recovery costs. Um, on the uh, issue of there being multiple capitals involved, so this is where it gets really tricky, because there was, you, you get into the issue of how much uh, some benefit is actually dependent on even a small amount of natural capital, versus uh, whether a small benefit depends on total impact capital. Now, in, in some of the work that's been done on uh, valuing ecosystem services, uh, Ian Bateman has done this, where he's calculated the value of the service net of the inputs and not the So he actually traces it back and takes out the other capital input. So you get the input that simply comes from natural capital. Um, I mean, I think this is an open question, how possible it's going to be that. It brings you into another debate, which is about the replaceability of that natural capital. Can you replace it with a reduced capital? Can you um, restore it or recover it quickly if it gets lost? So it, it ends up in a very complex set of issues. But for me, the most important question is, is there a natural capital component that is not easily replaceable? And if there is, then you need to. Um, I won't even go. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mark. Uh, just 
on the liability piece is that most of the companies we're talking to are looking, so that is the cost and benefits, negative and positive are included in their decision making process. Um, obviously, most of them um, are looking at what the benefits are to them, that's going to be the nice story. But um, the whole process, and this is something we're still grappling with, is how pictorial we need to be with something like the protocol about do you have to use everything that's material in it, or can you just do it to get something into the decision making process? So that's something that's still being discussed and we're still balancing with, but most of the focus are looking like. Yeah, Joe, there was a specific one uh, to you about how to have to pay. Well, we're still quite early days, but we have uh, produced initial accounts for fresh movements. Those such as they are available on the our, our website. Uh, the principles that we use to construct them Thanks, for So you directly Maxwell, uh, director of the Stanley Business Group, and author of Valuing Natural Capital. Thank you to all the speakers. So interesting. Um, one of the observations that I found across all of my work is that there's some amazing international projects, as people in the room will know, going on on developing data for natural systems that are really not <coughs> applied in the ways that you talked about, Georgina, and also Joe, in terms of how countries are now starting to develop their accounts for beyond GDP of the future. And it's not that these groups don't know about each other, often they're talking to one another, but it's that there's still a lack of clarity on the data, the format, the classification, the method. You alluded to that, Joe. So I think there's a real opportunity, and I'm not sure how to fix that challenge. It's just something that's an ongoing issue. Um, but as the UK is moving forward, and Georgina, you mentioned about what are we trying to use this information for, and where should we put the funding, and all that kind of thing, because we know this is a really expensive area. Um, I think there is an opportunity to connect the dots across these kind of things. So I guess it's really more of a comment, but if people have views on the panel on that, it would be really interesting to Valuation methods could be 
things invisible. Yeah, and <clears throat> Karen, I'm thinking of this sort of relationship between natural capital and the benefits, and this idea that maybe you can have uh, negative benefits. So I suppose even a lot of those curves that Joe Lina showed all seem to go up. There was no downturn um, on the increase. So if you take something like mosquitoes, then a few mosquitoes are probably a pretty good thing. Lots of bird food and probably probably more to the ecosystem and so on. But a lot of mosquitoes probably have a negative benefit. I think about floods recently, small floods, really good thing, moving sediments, uh, you know, dynamics of the system, providing habitats, inundating floodplains, really good. But, negative, but once they get to things that become negative, very negative in terms of benefits to people. And I guess that comes back to your question about managing the environment. What we've sort of decided to do as a society is to allow a certain amount of nature and then to manage the rest of it so that actually we get a trade off and we get the right balance of. The, nat the good things we get from the natural environment and the benefits we get from other sorts of management and other sort of manufactured <coughs> of the environment. So there's that sort of trade-off and maybe uh, balance there. So we don't, it's almost the same, we wouldn't probably want or could we even survive if everything was completely natural. So can you formulate that into your question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, the crux of it is at what point does uh, the, 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 the benefits start to tail off. You can have a natural system up to a certain point, and then after that point, you actually wouldn't want to have a natural system because people wouldn't be able to survive okay. under a natural system. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we've got three questions that what more points there. One about um, international, at an international level, we do have a state for natural systems. Perhaps, you know, do we have thoughts on how we can kind of bring that together or take better advantage of that and develop it? We have uh, the uh, idea that, of course, much of our, our, our environment is actually kind of semi-natural rather than actually natural. So how do measurement or valuation methods make visible or invisible the, the human managed element? And then we have a point about um, trade-offs, really, and at what point do benefits tail off? Actually, sorry, just to say, national accounting itself took about 20, 30, 40 years before it actually really emerged as a mature system of um, commercial accounting. But you know, it will take time, uh, and we have to take the opportunity to, to, to make sure that we're investing so much. Sorry, I didn't get that. Human activity. I think, obviously, human activity is crucial to this issue. Uh, for me, to the past in various ways. Human activity can, for example, uh, either produce or detract from the existence of natural capital as part of the way that we exist as uh, living individuals uh, as communities. Uh, uh, equally, uh, the, the value of the services which natural capital produces depends on how we as human beings in this society actually value it. So it's, it's not this is something which we, uh, an issue which exists in the rural automatons or we didn't exist. So I think human intervention of human activity is important. But I can see the way in which the accounting system and the government that would operate. In some cases, the, the activity is made by complex. And that's where we have to better understand how, uh, how the activity is affecting. Not 
So briefly on the international thing, I, I agree with the uh, great to bring all these data together. I think there's a lot of uh, data in corporates and in the UK as well that can feed into the ONS work. But the thing that I think is really interesting there is whether you can make these bottom-up measures, sort of sign-based or system-based um, uh, measures, add up to the top-down data that come to the ONS. So I think that that's an academically interesting thing. Um, Second two sets of questions about natural and um, man affected. I I think there's a bit of for me that there's a there's a big difference between <coughs> natural capital versus um, produced or human capital. One kind of way of thinking about the world versus natural versus man or the environment. So even if even in this room we are benefiting from natural capital, the atmosphere is part of the Earth system. It's part of the, the planet's own systems that have evolved and changed over the billions of years. The fact that we're sitting here um, entirely in a, a set of produced capital tables, chairs, clothes, etc., doesn't alter the fact that the way that we are interacting with our environment relies on natural capital. So natural capital is important in urban and man-made environments just as much as And I think that's been a big problem in this debate, is that it's pushed into the corner of, oh, this is all about the countryside. It's really not about the countryside. Um, the second thing is, frankly, uh, I barely believe that there is anywhere in the world, but definitely not in the UK, that is not managed. Um, we live in a managed world, I'm sorry, there's an awful lot of people, there's an awful lot of stuff, and uh, whether we manage it well or badly, Everything that we're interacting with in the natural world is, is, um, is effectively managed. So we've stuffed up the atmosphere, we've made a mess of it. Far too much carbon in it, in London, it's polluted. That is natural capital being badly managed by our activities. So I don't really buy this distinction between uh, altered, unaltered, managed, and unmanaged. I think it's extensive to manage it and when you're managed. Um, so for services, the, the reason that we don't have negatives on those graphs is just that I drew them as benefits. By definition, there's something that you're uh, drawing out how to improve the benefit. There was nothing that said the level of um, uh, water improvement in the blanket or was negative or positive. I think you draw a zero on y axis. You easily could do. And flooding is simply a case where we're managing the catchment badly with the negative consequences of flooding. Yeah, so I, I don't mind talking about negative benefits. It's like an old thing to say, um, just like negative. 
Lots of things around the, I won't answer too much because I'm going to be placed around the monitoring systems. But the, some really interesting work coming out of GEO um, in uh, Switzerland, and some of the spatial planning data, natural capital project, and real and other things they're doing. There's some really interesting work going on at the moment. I think more than we can link that up, connect those pieces together. Um, but actually, in the UK, I think we're going to be able to place more stuff. Yeah. Um, just on the point about uh, so the time uh, what was the optimal way to, to proceed. When we first took
So actually what we did was put away kind of two track approach. And one was to say, well, what information have we got immediately available? Uh, we know that it's got various kinds of deficiencies, but can we sort of start to tackle <coughs> some of the major deficiencies and sort of make it better? But knowing this is quite a long way short. But at the same time, to start to work on the bottom-up approach, which is to do uh, better uh, more considered valuations uh, on the more uh, uh, systematic basis. Uh, and that's sort of what we've been doing since. So the information we've got at the moment is kind of an amalgam of some of the starting where you are using the information immediately available to make it better. And the, well, this is what we really think we should be working now, there are some dangers in that, um, because it means that people uh, may well take the information that they put out in a more uh, well based than it actually is. Uh, but nevertheless, we felt it's better to start to get this information into the world and to start to use it, and people to criticize it in that way to start to make it better, than just to sort of not put anything out and say, well, let's wait until we've got some new. Yes, I mean, I, I think I agree with that. I think the, um, the, the, you know, it's a very complicated process, so the right thing to do is to, <coughs> to start with something that you can do and do that and then build up the expertise and the data sets and try and bring them together over time. Um, uh, so <coughs> this question of um, why monitor and how do we decide what to monitor, I mean, I, the reason, well, the reason we're doing this in the first place is, as Joe was explained, that there's no point in doing it unless it improves decision making at some level. Um, it may be a very generic level about maintaining the or it may be very specific that there are some magic capital assets that are degrading the rapidly and we need to do something about it. So I, I think that guides our decision making in many ways. Um, given the scale and the And there are three things that are easy to get going on. One is they're very happy to stop them there already, they can just bring in and use. Uh, one is the high value, and I mean, I don't think the monetary value, I mean, it's something that matter to people out of the economy. And the other is the high risk. And we did a bit of work in the Natural Capital Committee, particularly on these high value versus high risk systems that you might want to prioritize for investment. Um, and then, uh, yes, I mean, I, I didn't mean to imply that we should prioritize for restoration monitoring. Just my point was generally, you monitor with a view to what it is you're ultimately trying to achieve. And the 25 year plan is about restoring natural capital broadly. So if you were allocating resources for monitoring efficiently, you would allocate the resources to monitor things by monitoring.
in fact on actually doing the management of those reports. <coughs> so you might have someone who has an asset that they're using in a particular way. What I have in mind is up and farming in those areas currently using other floods. And how in this can be used to try to come to a decision around managing someone's property in a way that they might not like to Um, so we, sorry, my name is Tom Alex from um, We've been talking um, about the need to prioritise uh, some of the work we're doing and break up into bite sized pieces. And Joe, also, you mentioned one of your main challenges in that mainstream uh, some of this work. Um, in the last few weeks, we've had an issue in the UK uh, in the project, which has been very mainstream, um, and to many people, it's got very obvious links to natural capital. Um, is this an opportunity that you are able or will be able to use um, to push your kind of work and to make it more mainstream? Are you getting people in the bus that the main have given us attention coming to you now and seeing more importance to this? Or is, is it an opportunity you can use to push the importance of natural gas work out? I'm And so ultimately, it wouldn't be in conflict with property rights. It would be part of um, managing the property <coughs> properly. If you had proper allocation of costs and benefits for using natural capital when and not when, it would come out in the, um, in the accounts of the land. I agree at the moment. <laughs> um, um, on the monetary stuff, um, so I, I want to distinguish between values and prices, prices being what people pay for something, which is definitely not the same thing as what it's worth, and then whether or not you can turn that into a monetary unit is a secondary question, so there are two levels. Economists like to turn everything into money because it makes it exchange. And I'm sure um, you know, ONS would be much happier if we could put it all in pound signs because it then it goes into this certain set of signs and equations. And so, uh, there are definitely bits of natural capital for which coming up with a monetary valuation is, in my view, so arbitrary as to become a really hard to see exercise. <coughs> exactly how we bring together those. I think there are ways of thinking about it, but I agree with you. I don't know how many of you have the Rick's meeting um, 
September 2014, the Ricks did bring to the Royal Chapel Street. So that's brought together some people start thinking about that, and that conversation has been ongoing. My takeaway from that meeting was that they were saying, we'll wait until the accountancy bodies have worked it out before we get involved, which wasn't necessarily the answer I was hoping for. But I totally agree, the whole thing that Eugene was saying about property ownership is something we're discussing quite a lot, particularly through the enabling environment work that we're doing. Um, with the uh, qualitative, quantitative, and monetary question, um, there's, uh, we're very clear in the work that we're doing that it's about decision making and the best information to make that decision. It's not about putting a value into a monetary value. Um, that said, there is a movement, particularly for financial institutions, um, that we're looking for one number. In fact, there's one big investor that has said that they will have one number for their natural capital of all of their 700 um, assets quite soon. Um, that is impossible and it will be demeaning to all the work we're doing. Um, and we're very clear that that isn't what we're aiming for here. It's a lot, much more complex than that. Um, it's, we've got to come back down to, at this stage at least, about decision making. What's the best information to influence that decision? And sometimes when you're making a capex decision about investment, it makes sense to put in monetary values. Other times when you're making operational decisions about what to do, it makes sense to have a narrative, a qualitative story. So we've got to make sure that, that balance is still there something I do end up having to say seven or eight times a day to people because there's a lot of pushback on that. Finally, on the flooding and sales, I thought it was fascinating on Boxing Day, the two main stories were one, that there was major flooding, worst we've seen, etc., and that we're spending more money than ever on buying Thneed, if you've seen Laura Hanks or anything like that, um, earth rubbish, whatever you want to call it. Sales were very, very high this year. Okay? No one, I didn't see very few articles that was actually connecting these two things. We need to do something to connect, actually, the way that we're living our lives and actually then the flood. And actually, these two main stories, which are the only main stories of Boxing Day, were completely separate. I mean, that's a big mistake. Yeah. Well, just to kind of pick up on to what extent we can use a as a good example of what we're this, um, I think it was worked to do. Um, we didn't get the connections we need, the Boxing Day is the same. Uh, on the other hand, there was certain ambition. Actually, also to take management decisions and, uh, and what to do about it. Uh, and it seems to me that's where we're still challenge. <coughs> more or less, the more and more the natural phenomena and natural capital issues uh, impinge on our consciousness, if they are to be quite very difficult, that seems to be kind of fertile ground. We would say, hey, look, there's some really interesting stuff here. Some knowledge, some measurements, some metrics, uh, some innovation which can help us with these different issues. Uh, natural, national accounting, as I say, took uh, uh, several decades to actually impinge on kind of public debate. Uh, the first national accounts in the world, by the way, was produced in the UK in 1926, and uh, not in America in 1934. Uh, they were actually suppressed by the Treasury at the time, the Prince of Mercy. <laughs> 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 they do it, so it's not quite subversive about this aspect, but also something powerful. I think it's really a question about whether we can use these, these opportunities uh, to actually push these agendas forward. And that's an issue for all of us. I think with the encouraging signs, uh, Declan Minister now seems to take natural capital to be a really important unifying principle in the area. So encouraging signs will all work to sort of uh, And finally, on values. I don't myself find the difference between economic value and value in the bar actually a very helpful one. It is one value, which is what we as human beings attribute as the services we receive from assets of various kinds. I do agree that there is a difference between what you get if you take a market price and the total value that is uh, obtained. That's not a new issue. Cost benefit analysis is all about how you, uh, how you account for sometimes monetarily, sometimes not. The non-market benefits are just the real kind of decision. So I don't think it's a new issue, but there are lots of technical issues about how you actually work through what those non-market values are, and place a sensible weight and a sensible quantification. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm afraid we've run out of time there.